Hello, thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to our third workshop in the Eyewitness Virtual Event Series. My name is Josna Harris and I'm with Climate Generation, a Will Steger Legacy. And I will be moderating the workshop today. I am joining you from my home in Minnesota, which is on the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. So welcome. If you um, would like to paste in the chat where you are joining from, if you could include your name, the location where you are, and if you know the native lands that you are on, please include that too. Today's topic, Rebuilding the New, Another World is Possible, is one that I am particularly excited to think about. If you are not familiar with our organization, Climate Generation has an organizational vision to um, build a world of resilient communities with equitable solutions to climate change. So this is a theme that we think about regularly. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that it is challenging to be uplifting and optimistic about the world that is possible because I don't really need to tell you that the world we are living in is an incredibly broken one. And many of us are just trying to survive. And to be honest, at times, it is really hard to keep a focus on rebuilding and to be able to um, be positive about the possibilities. Yet the importance of our work to advance equitable climate solutions, racial justice, and to come together to build community together could not be more clear or pressing. And to be sure that we all have an opportunity to do this, of course, one of the ways is to show up this November 3rd at the polls and to use our votes with climate justice in mind. So if you are eligible to vote, um, please be registered and ready to go because that is one way that we can show an impact. We know that we really don't have enough opportunities to hold space like this one, to come together, to collectively hold the grief that we feel, and to envision a better future. And we are really living in a time, all of us, uh, where we are experiencing these overlapping crises in our world, COVID-19, racial injustice, and climate change. Before we can really even think about envisioning a better world, we wanna just take a moment to acknowledge all of the people who are experiencing 
hardship right now. And to take a moment of silence for all of the lives that we have lost through the coronavirus pandemic, through police violence on black lives, and through climate impacts, most recently hurricanes and wildfires and more. So please join me in taking a moment of silence now. Thank you. One thing that we know can be helpful is to actually give name to the emotions that we feel, whether that is grief or anxiety or anger about the world that we have right now. And really that simple act of naming can bring a sense of validation to what you feel and can also bring a release and prompt healing. So I'd like to invite you now to post in the chat some of the emotions that have been coming up for you recently. So go ahead and do that now. When you think about our overlapping crises, what are some of the emotions that come up for you? Go ahead and name them and release them now. This, all these emotions that we feel um, can also serve as a transformational catalyst that can galvanize us. And research shows that we navigate towards what we focus on. So what if, you know, what would happen if we shifted our thinking from catastrophic failure to catastrophic success? What would that look like? Even if that does feel impossible at times. Today, you're gonna to get to hear from three incredible guests who are joining us, Taji Joseph, Eric Holthouse, and Robert Blake. And then you will also get a chance to imagine a better future, what a better world would look like. So we hope that you will walk away feeling inspired and with a renewed sense of, motiv of motivation to keep going. And this is really the work that we all must be willing to do, right? Um, to find clarity in our vision and then to get really good about telling that story of how we're gonna get there together. Because it's gonna take all of us, it's gonna require all of us. So I'm super glad to be here with all of you and to know that I am not alone. So this series, um, if you haven't been a part of it, we've been talking about the intersections of climate change and racial injustice and how they are really deeply interconnected. Climate justice is racial justice and we really cannot effectively address one without addressing the other. If you missed the two previous workshops, you can still catch the replay um, and you'll get to hear from some of the inspiring speakers who shared their experiences of climate change through stories, music, poetry and art. This series also celebrates a new book called Eyewitness, which has been written by people all across the state of Minnesota who are sharing their stories of climate change. So we invite you to learn more about the Eyewitness book and project by clicking on the button at the bottom of your screen that says Explore Eyewitness. And Climate Generation will also be hand delivering copies of the Eyewitness book along with constituent letters from every legislative district in the state. And we are collecting letters now. So stay tuned because we will share an opportunity later for how you can get involved in that project and engage your policymaker no matter where you live. And we'll actually be posing live action opportunities throughout the workshop today. So um, you will have a chance to listen to our incredible speakers so we invite you to do that, listen and learn from them, but also to lean into the role that your own voice can play in demanding climate justice. So we're gonna practice that with our first action opportunity. And this is a petition um, where we are urging our legislators to take action on climate justice. So we'd love for you to participate by signing it 
And you can find the petition by clicking on the button below or finding the link in the chat. And this petition is calling our legislators to advance deep and transformative solutions that make it clear that racial justice is climate justice and that they are inseparable. And if you're not from Minnesota, you are welcome to make a copy of this petition and send it to your own legislators. So we're gonna give you a minute now to sign this petition if you haven't already. We'll be sending signatures in bulk after today's workshop. So if you didn't get a chance to sign it, you can go ahead and save that link and sign it after the workshop. So with that, I am thrilled to introduce to you our first guest. And again, um, we've been doing this series, just a show of love and support in the chat whenever a guest speaker is talking. So if you wanna show love, support, reciprocity to the speaker at any time, please post in the chat. Um, and with that, I'm gonna introduce Taji Joseph. And as I do that, I'd love for you to give him a warm welcome in the chat. As a visual artist, Taji blends unconventional items and natural elements through the intentional and nuanced method of repurposing, creating a visual narrative that takes what seems like mundane, the mundane in life and transforming it. Taji uses a variety of materials from ac acrylic paint, spray paint, glass, small ornaments from thrift stores into a process that conjoins them with objects found in nature such as flowers, tree bark, stones, and dirt. Welcome Taji, it's good to Hello. see you. Good to see you as well. Yeah, thanks for being here with us. Yeah, no problem. Awesome, hey everyone. So uh, as she said before, my name is Taji Joseph. I'm a black visual artist, born and raised in North Minneapolis. Uh, so I thought today I'd speak about my artwork, uh, how I feel these past few months with the pandemic and everything going on. Uh, so while my main focus has been on drawing, uh, during the last few months I've shifted mostly to mixed media. Uh, so that way I can get more of my emotions out, uh, my mental health, how I react to life at the moment. So yeah, uh, let's bring up those images and see what's happening. So for this piece, I was focused mainly on water, uh, how it's very important to us and as human beings, and therefore we have, uh, we have the world in our hands, basically, where the decisions we make affect our futures, our sons and daughters, and how that is very effective and we have to take a stand immediately to address those concerns so it's waves i call it waves because it's like pretty interesting how it transfers from the ice cubes into the water so water can melt and that way we can, we can stop and do our, our things so go into the next one and this piece is called wildfire uh, I thought of this behind the protests going on currently in our city, uh, throughout the world as well. Uh, this also is a combination of the wildflowers currently going on in California. And I was recently there about last week. So I was able to experience how all the skies are covered in smoke and fog. Um, yeah, it's very, 
eye opening when you see all the devastation going on in our country, uh, especially nature. How I'm very in tune with nature, so when it hurts, I hurt as well. Yeah. So go on to the next one. And for this piece called Aftermath, it was also in the book, the Eyewitness book, where I gave my interpretation of our future and what it could look like if we do choose to do nothing, where everything could potentially turn to ash. So in this piece, I use a lot of different materials, uh, tree bark, glass, rocks, branches. Uh, I try to eclipse almost everything that that could be used. So that way it could be more effective how we all see these images every day. We all see trees, we all see dirt and rocks, how it may be insignificant to some others. It's very powerful to me. So I like to use all those materials and present a powerful artwork going forward. And let me see this one. This one's called Closed Winter. So since we live in Minnesota, our winters are pretty hectic sometimes. So uh, I try to envision how that made me feel going, growing up here in this state. So uh, it's very abstract looking. So it's kind of up for your, your interpretation, how you feel about winter or the cold in general. Uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I actually enjoy the cold, which is pretty weird since I live in Minnesota, but uh, uh, I don't like the heat that much, but yeah. Um, for the oh, yeah. And this piece is called Stay Gold, uh, which I made, I think, a couple months ago, where it's an, it built off the quote from the Outsiders, the book, uh, Stay Gold, how even though in these hard times you have to stay positive or be a hopeful for the outlook of life where uh, uh, having a positive mantra, if you will. So where you can envision how things will look in the future uh, and keep up the good fight. Next one. And this one's called Rebirth. So it's actually built off Stay Gold and Aftermath where through these hard times, we will eventually come over the top, uh, be your political leanings or uh, envisions for how life can be for us humans, uh, not only in America, but the world in general. So it's very expressive where we have like flowers where it can be bursting of joy and glee. And even though we're currently in some dark times, I've Feel we have a very positive outlook we can have going moving forward. And move on to next one. And then Girasol is more of a abstract representation where it's more up to the interpretation of how you feel, I guess. Uh, for me, it's more of a creative expression where due to the coronavirus and pandemic going on, I've been kind of cooped up in the house for quite a few months. So in time, my creativity was able to express itself more genuinely. Um, what else? So yeah, do that. Like I was able to, to hone in my skills, I guess. Uh, one of the somewhat positives from coronavirus is I've been able to kind of relax, uh, address my mental health, uh, take time to appreciate life on earth um, and then trying to way to express that as well. So, yeah, those are my pieces that I currently made during these past few months that I felt uh, resonated with the, the theme of the speaking show today. So, yeah, I think that was all the pictures I have there. Mm -hmm. So in like review, I really appreciate being here and be able to express my artwork as well, uh, how I how I respond to current political events going on, whether it be the protests or uh, election cycles going on. Uh, yeah. So 
I don't know what else to talk about. Um, yeah, that's how I, that's how I speak. I I'm not much of a public speaker, so I like to speak through my artwork. Uh, I feel like it does more, a better job for me than that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Here we go. Yeah, thank you, Itachi. No, I think you're a wonderful speaker, and obviously your work is beautiful and evocative and powerful. Um, it really resonated with me when you said that, um, you know, when nature hurts, you hurt. I feel like that's vice versa right now, too, and that nature is really showing us some of those emotions we expressed earlier about anger and rage and deep sadness. Um, so I appreciate the work that you do in really bringing that to life. Um, I think when I first saw your work, I it made me realize kind of what you do is taking fragments of things and putting them together in such a beautiful way, which I think is very much on topic of rebuilding um, and thinking about the world that is possible. So I want to thank you for joining us today and, and being part of this. No problem. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for showing Taji some love in the chat. You can um, learn more about Taji's work through the link that was posted. We also have information on how you can follow each of our guests um, during the end of the workshop. Um, so next, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our next guest who is Eric Holthouse. And um, I'm really excited to hear from Eric and just um, thinking about some of the recent work that he's done to really deeply think about um, this story of how we are going to get there um, in the next decade. So I'm going to introduce Eric and I'd love for you again to show Eric some love in the chat. Um, words of encouragement, welcome would be appreciated. Hi, Eric. Hi, thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. I'm just going to introduce you real quick. Okay, great. So Eric is a meteorologist and a climate journalist in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, which is where you're joining us from today. Um, and your work focuses on the need to simultaneously draw attention to the systemic injustice and the pressing dangers of the climate emergency and to really build transformative change and an ecologically focused society that works for everyone. Mm -hmm. And Eric, you also recently wrote a book called The Future Earth, A Radical Vision for What's Possible in the Age of Warming, which is just a really powerful vision of what the future could be. So thanks for joining us, Eric. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's just really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, um, working alongside uh, a group that is so meaningful for for advocating for change in Minnesota. Um, um, I think that um, the this this focus is exactly right that we're we can't think of of the work that we have to do other than of uh, than just building a world that's focused on justice. I think that I think often we get bogged down in the science or um the charts and graphs and honestly the fear that we have been taught to feel about uh, about climate change for the last 30 years and um in my in my work what i try to do is to build up um hopefully eventually an even more powerful force for um for this aspirational hopeful vision of a of a different world um that we're working actually towards a better world rather than just trying to fight against all of the powers that are um feels like are destroying the world right now so yeah, uh, really appreciate both are needed and that's de definitely what the focus of this event is today for yeah sure. thank you no i often think about that i think when i first learned about climate change mm -hmm. when i would see all the graphs and numbers my eyes would kind of glaze over and i felt like the gravity of it but it didn't really connect to who i am and so i love um thinking about how our own humanity is really present in this issue and it's a mm -hmm. human right, human rights issue. Mm -hmm. So appreciate the, the story that you're bringing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what can be more intimate than the planet that gave us all life, right? Like this is, uh, we're supposed to feel very deeply about this place and to see um, the world moving in a direction towards chaos is really um, hard for everyone. I mean, um, it's not it's not just you that feels 
um, clearly, you know, all the emotions that were shared, everyone's feeling um, something very deeply right now. So, um, well, I will give you the virtual sure. stage and we'll see you in a minute. Great. Um, so what I'd like to do is to read something that I wrote earlier this year uh, in January. This is not included in my book, but my book is a, a very similar um, perspective, uh, sort of looking at the future from the perspective of the past. So in this article, I wrote from the perspective of the year 2030, looking back to see how we were able to create um, the radical change that's, that's needed. So I'm just going to read a little bit. Um, and I just put the link in there in case any uh, one prefers to read along. Um, okay. There are an infinite number of possible paths ahead of us and what follows is just one of them gathered with some help from friends around the world. This is a story of our journey to 2030, a vision of what it could look and feel like if we finally radically collectively act to build a world we all want to live in. 2020. In a climate emergency, courage is not just a choice, it's strategic, it's a survival strategy. Letting go of the life you thought you were going to have can cause a huge amount of grief. There's a huge amount of courage in opening up to redefining your existence. There's a huge amount of bravery to know that perhaps life gets even richer and deeper in unexpected ways. It only takes three and a half percent of the population to bring about political change. In New Zealand, approximately three and a half percent of the population participated in the climate strikes in autumn of 2019, which was almost immediately followed by the country adopting one of the boldest climate goals in the world to cut carbon emissions to zero by 2050. Building on New Zealand's pioneering policy, 2020 is the year we acknowledge that the most urgent thing we can do in an emergency is to passionately tell others that it exists. The call to protect the planet will become a rallying cry as climate strikes around the world continue to escalate. More people will begin to demand a better world that works for everyone. This climate movement will catalyze urgent revolutionary policy to tackle the crisis. We'll still know in 2020 that we have to do a lot better, but admitting that we're in an emergency means we can start to tell ourselves new stories that will help get us out of the crisis. We will redefine happiness. We will watch hopeful television and movies about a possible world that does not yet exist. We will stop seeing the earth as an external thing to be saved. We will realize that we are inextricably linked to the planet. Saving it is in fact saving ourselves. In 2021, there will be mounting social pressure for climate laws far more ambitious than New Zealand's law. To do enough on climate, some of the rich high emitting countries will have to be net carbon zero by 2025. Nearly all wealthy countries will have to be zero carbon by 2030. It doesn't matter which government is in power, elections move too slowly. Voting feels helpless when the choice is between denial and delay. We will demand candidates that recognize the reality of this crisis. In 2021, a new president of the world's largest greenhouse gas emitter, the United States, will pass a series of sweeping legislative changes to bring about a Green New Deal and to help permanently decentralize political power from the extractive industries that have concentrated wealth for centuries. George Monbiot has called this process, quote, political rewilding, where top-down governance is replaced with more participatory, participatory spontaneous bottom-up models, but it's probably more easily understood as accountability. It's the idea that industries holding the power to end civilization as we know it shouldn't regulate themselves. It's the idea that government officials shouldn't put corporate profits over the public good. It's the idea that protecting the security of all life on earth is really just about loving each other. We will begin to redefine democracy through demonstrations demanding climate justice. We will begin to redefine freedom in an era where the air we breathe embodies the deadly choices made by white men for hundreds of years. This is how people will begin to listen again and exert mortal, moral 
leadership in all the positions of power we hold in our lives. 2022, we will begin to redefine individual actions as actions on behalf of the collective. We will see care work and mutual aid as being at the core of climate action. The term climate action will start to lose meaning. It will just become action. We will begin the process of climate reparations, partially repairing the loss and damage of colonialism and decentralizing political power on a global scale. We will begin the process of returning land to indigenous control. We will see each other as people deserving of the right to thrive. Indigenous people have for centuries effectively managed more than 80% of the world's biodiversity. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People provides a particularly effective model for how to uphold peaceful nation-to-nation -nation relationships while simultaneously building a world that works for everyone. We as humans have known how to do this for a very long time. We will remember how to do it again. We will finally reach peak global emissions. We will finally stop accelerated tor towards our own destruction. 2023, we will criminalize and delegitimize the, the fossil fuel industry. Fossil fuel executives will be tried for crimes against humanity. Ecocide tribunals will hold those to account for making parts of the earth uninhabitable. We will march through the streets of our coastal cities and along the shores of the future seas in solidarity and celebration as our oppressor oppressors are held to justice. We will courageously name the people who created our burning world without fear of, retri rep of retribution because they will be made powerless by our vision of a better world. History will remember our decades of inaction to tackle the climate crisis as one of humanity's most profound mistakes. We will realize we have lost so much, but there is still so much worth fighting for. We will prioritize our own psychological and emotional resilience. We will take walks by the river. We will visit our friends. 2024, we will at last have created the moral and cultural infrastructure for rapid decarbonization of every aspect of our civilization. We will electrify everything, trains, heating, steel-making, farm tractors. S since carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, we will focus most intensely on other greenhouse gases, such as methane and nitrous oxide. We will listen to farmers who use their wisdom to radically reform agriculture so that farms produce food, not commodities. While we'll continue to plant new trees, we will focus our efforts on saving forests, which suck a greater amount of carbon dioxide out of the air and minimize the risk of using much needed arable land in ways that do not support the local ecosystem. We will decrease global emissions by 10% in a single year and hold that pace for the rest of the decade. It will be the first year in history that we will be doing enough to slow the climate emergency. In 2025, we will have long begun seeing cars as, as death machines, which steal half the surface area of our cities. At this point, there will be so much more space available for quality housing for all, for parks, for city farms, for life. We will have long begun to claim, reclaim lawns and parking lots in our cities for people and gardens. We will take back public spaces that have been privatized. We will begin to feel comfortable around each other in public again because we love each other and we always have. We have always liked meeting new people, so our public spaces will help us do that instead of isolating us in outdated cubicles of individualism. We will rebuild our cities and redesign our roads for walking, bicycles, and those who move slowly. Public transit will be free because it doesn't make sense for it not to be. We will have pedestrian first towns and cities the way it should have always been. We will all learn to move more slowly. The places we live will be aspirational because living a good life was always the point. In 2026, we will redefine what we mean by technology. We do not need more gadgets, we need more connection. We do not need more entertainment, we need more empathy. We do not need virtual reality, we need reality. That the backlash against big tech has already become, begun and we will continue to hold them accountable for using us as cogs in the wheels of extractive capitalism. We will reject the lie that technology inherently cures loneliness. We will reject technology companies' efforts to commodify our desire for community. Midway through this transformational decade, we will begin to realize 
that what we had been craving all along was a sense of purpose. We wanted to do work that was meaningful. We wanted to belong to something bigger than ourselves. Through art, music, memes, and methods yet to be invented, we will laugh and love and interpret what it means to be part of a thriving global civilization in the middle of the most transcendent decade in human history. 2027, we will expand our practice of re regenerative agriculture. I say practice because working in partnership with nature to produce our food is something we knew how to do for thousands of years before we began expanding monoculture agriculture. The old practice of growing a single crop over large swaths of land has had stripped the soil of nutrients, but we will have returned to even more ancient sustainable techniques such as intercropping, where different plants grow side by side, fostering the diversity on which nature thrives. Food produced this way requires less pesticides and fertilizer, allowing for a thriving ecosystem that supports more wildlife. We will relearn what we have forgotten. We will build a circular economy. 2028, we will begin decommodifying our own survival. That is, we will provide all the, all the necessities for survival as a human right. We will no longer be earning a living or letting how productive we are determine our individual importance to society. We will give each other what we deserved all along, acceptance as a fellow living being. It's this runaway cycle of production for profit at all costs that created the climate crisis. Stopping this cycle is possible by changing how the economy works. We will abandon the concept of growth for growth's sake. We will celebrate inefficiency. We will call it creativity. We will call it living. By establishing a civilization that values life instead of production, we will recalibrate the economy to care for people and the planet's needs. Our worth won't be tied to how much we can produce for people who are already rich. We will build a society that guarantees the basics of survival, food, water, shelter, community to everyone. 2029, as the decade draws to a close, we will celebrate that our efforts have cut emissions in half globally for the past over the past 10 years. Many countries will reach the goal of zero carbon emissions far sooner than their leaders had thought possible. We will finally be on pace for a world without catastrophic climate change but that will be only a small part of our achievement. We will have remade what it looks and feels like to be alive. We will have done all of this because we had to in order to survive. But after it is done, we will realize that we did it so that we could thrive. We will, under, we will be unable to remember what the old world was like. The key in hindsight was understanding that revolutionary change starts with changing how we see how each of us fits into the world. In 2030, perhaps the most radical change of all this decade will be our newfound ability to tell a story, a positive story about the future and mean it. What that story looks like will probably be very different than what you've just read, but it will feel very much the same. It will feel like something you've always wanted but never thought you'd get. You deserve it. That is what we have to do now in the first days of 2020. Dream un unashamedly big dreams, dreams that reimagine the more just and loving world we want to live in, not the one traditional science fiction or even the media suggests is inevitable. Put these dreams to paper, speak them into the world, and work together to make them a reality. Oh my goodness. So Eric, I have um, read that in written form, but to hear you speak it um, felt emotional and cathartic to just let your words wash over me because you were speaking as though it was. And I think at first, as you were reading, I felt cynical about, oh, well, this can't be like the way that it's going to be. But as you continue to read, I felt like it, you were just speaking truth. And um, I felt myself kind of let my shoulders relax and the anxiety of it all kind of um, roll off my shoulders and to feel what you were saying. And even just to hear somebody speak 
about the possible world as though it is, is so powerful. And I really um, appreciate the provocative questions that you asked. I wrote some of them down. Um, is a possible world that does not exist that we can demand? What is that? What are the stories that we can tell ourselves how we will get there? And just some words that I wrote down were empathy, laughter, love, solidarity, celebration, courage, emotional and social resilience, and that what we'll need to get there is rejection and to demand, hold accountable, to return, recalibrate, regenerate, thrive, and dream. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Whew, so I am really feeling that, but I would like to invite you all to think about what Eric said and what is your vision of the future? So right now we are gonna have a chance to think about that and write about it. So I'd like to invite you to grab a notebook, grab a piece of paper to jot it down. Um, and before we begin, we're actually gonna just do a little bit of a grounding exercise. So what I'd like you to do right now is to just kind of shift your focus into the present moment. I'd like to invite you to slow it down and kind of place both of your feet firmly on the ground. I invite you to close your eyes, slow down your breath by inhaling and exhaling deeply. And I'd like you to imagine what would a better world look like to you? So take a moment to move through it in your mind. And then when you have it, go ahead and write it down. So we'll take a few moments now for you to do that.
So thank you all. I'm sure that you could have used more time for your vision and definitely encourage you to build on what you've imagined today. But in the meantime, we'd love to hear what came up for you. So using the chat, we'd love for you to share what you wrote. Um, what would a better world look like to you? So you can write the emotions that you would feel, the ways that you would get there, the things that it would incorporate. So go ahead now, and we're gonna take two more minutes for you to type that in the chat. So many amazing things in the chat right now. So if you haven't gotten a chance to look over what everybody's written, please, um, please take a look. I am excited to introduce our third speaker to you um, who just has a really infectious joy about him. Um, Robert Blake is our um, third guest and he is otherwise known as Bob Blake from Red Lake, who I am thrilled to introduce. Um, so Bob is just one of those people that exude joy and positivity and determination. So I'd love for you to welcome Bob, show him some love in the chat again. And um, we're gonna call Bob up to the screen while I am reading his introduction. So Bob is the owner of Solar Bear, which is a solar installation company located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The Ojibwe pronunciation is Gizi Somakwa. Bob is the executive director of Native Sun Community Power Development, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing meaningful employment to indigenous people in the solar trade. Bob is joining us today from the Red Lake Reservation near Bemidji, Minnesota, and literally is hopping down from the roof from a solar installation. So we'll give a minute here to see if Bob can join us on screen. And as we're waiting for Bob, if you haven't had a chance to post your vision in the chat, or if you haven't had a chance to read what others have written, please go ahead and do that. So I'm not sure that we're gonna be able to get Bob to join us here live, um, but we do have a backup, um, which is Bob's climate story through video. 
which we are going to play for you now um, and hope that his enthusiasm um, and joy is really, really comes through in that. So just a moment and we will pull that up. I'm Bob Lake from Red Lake. Uh, I'm from the Red Lake Tribal Nation. And uh, uncle, brother, um, son, uh, friend, uh, co-worker, um, global citizen. Uh, I first heard about climate change about 10 or 12 years ago and uh, didn't think too much about it then. Um, and then, um, you know, my, my brother, my brother got sick and um, he needed a new heart. And uh, he was a police officer here in Minneapolis and uh, he had children and uh, he passed away. But before he passed away, he asked me to get his kids through college. And he said uh, to walk his daughters down the aisle is what he asked me to do. There was this unbelievable, this, this desire to want to make this world better for them. I had no idea how to be a parent. And then all of a sudden, I was like this surrogate father to like these kids, and they're all looking at me for direction. And then I was like, I have to do something. And I was already aware of climate change, but wasn't really you know, taking action. I really thought that this was something that was too big. It was just something too complex. And I couldn't do anything about it. I'm just one person. And then something about being the surrogate father to these kids just made me feel like I could take on the world. That is really when I decided to take action. I create a business plan at MCTC. One of my business management classes on a solar company called Solar Bear. Solar Bear's native uh, name is Gizi Somakwa. And um, Gizis means sun, um, Makwa means bear. Um, Hello? Hello? Hi, everyone. Bob, it's so good to see you. Hey. I'm glad we got this to work. I'm so sorry about this, everyone. We are currently installing solar upstairs right now. <laughs> I remember you saying that. I think that's so awesome. Uh, I'm going to let you take it away, Bob. Thanks sure. for joining. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I want to apologize right now. Um, I am. We are currently installing solar. Here's Solar Bear right here. Here's the hat. Uh, we got our safety vest on. The guys are upstairs right now. Um, Actually, I think they're getting off their lunch break right now. Um, but um, we are currently installing solar right now. We're, I'm on the Red Lake Indian Reservation right now. Uh, we have eight tribal members that are currently upstairs right now uh, laying down uh, the solar panels at, uh, mm -hmm. today. And um, I just want to say I am so sorry, guys, that it had to – I couldn't find a computer. Um, I'm in this little room. Um that I could get away from and there was just so much going on. So, but I, I, I loved uh, what the last guy said. I want to echo everything that he said. That was really cool. Whatever that stuff that he wrote and, um, and what Taj is doing with his art. Um, I guess for me, I'm just really looking at the point of how can we, um, I'm trying to stable this too. Uh, how can we go ahead and, um, uh, you know, like, let's build it like, 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 let's, let's start, like, let's put solar everywhere. That's what I want to do. Charging stations, uh, you name it. I want, I want to build tribal utilities. Um, I always say that, you know, I want the tribes to, to lead in this direction because we don't have the Republicans or the Democrats stopping us. We can just move on this. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do um, with this. And I think that that's the new world that I envision. I envision this world where, tribal nations are going to be leading this. And I will say, what, what does it look like, you know, as the United States backs out of the climate, Paris, the, the, the Paris Climate Treaty Agreement, and all tribal nations on Turtle Island here in the United States are backing in, you know? And uh, I tell Native people, we can't take back the land physically, we can't start a war, 
you know, we did that one time, but what we can do right now is we could take it back morally. And right is right now is the time. And um, we do it through climate change. We do it through the environment. Uh, we do it through the things that have made native people, uh, you know, and in connection to the environment as a whole for generations. And so that's what I'm really excited about. I, I, I get so proud when I see these guys working upstairs. Like, I, you can't believe how happy I am that they love putting up solar. Like, I'm just like, this is so exciting to me. Um, and, you know, this, this place is going to be the training center. It's under construction, too. But this is going to be the training center. Uh, and so this is going to be a hands-on uh, solar array that the, that the tribal members here can really, you know, uh, get their hands on and they can really learn this trade. So uh, I'm really excited about this, I'm really happy about this. And um, I see so many other tribes that are moving in this direction now. Before, I must, I must have sounded like a crazy guy talking about renewable energy and utilities and how we can make these make these things and how they will prosper for for tribal nations and i i i, I now i see all these different tribes that are getting involved and it just makes me so proud and so happy and and to all of you that have supported that have helped uh with our projects thank you so much the faith community I mean, and this is how we do it people this is how we come together you know that we crowdsource these funds and we're putting native people to work, helping them, helping a tribal nation try and reach their renewable energy goals to get off fossil fuels, to fight the pipeline. I mean, this is how we do it. Like, and, and we, we, we're all coming together in doing this. And so, and, and it's not foundation money. It's not government money. It's just people. It's regular people like us. Uh, so it, it I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just so excited. Um, that everything um, is working out in the way it should. And um, please, I mean, uh, we, we, we can do this. We, we can, uh, we are doing it. And, and we can definitely uh, have a better future. And the time is now, and we got to move on it. And so whether it's through policy, whether it's through building solar systems, whether it's workforce development, uh, we just have to, we just have to move forward. So I hope that all of you can see this because I, this is a phone. And so I don't know if it's really connecting to everything, but um, thank you so much, everyone, for having me and, and, and supporting Solar Bear and Native Sun. Um, Jasa, did, could you hear me? Cause yeah, I'm definitely. Not I could hear everything you were saying, and I think everybody <laughs> else did too. So yeah, it's a good reminder that we have to be patient with technology while you're actually like leapfrogging technology up on the roof. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but this is great though. Like we're talking about building the better future. Um, we're doing it. Like this is happening. Yeah, I love that message. I think sometimes I forget. Like there are examples of climate justice and solutions that are happening right now, and you know we can actually look at those as really how we can. We just need to do more of that, you know. And it's happening right now. And I love that message that let's just do it. We're doing it already. And we just need to keep doing it more and not give up. And, 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 and let's come together and do it. You know, like we had the faith community that raised the money for this project. We've got the, you know, we've got the guys here that are doing the project, you know, and the community is coming together around this. I mean, this is how we come together instead of all the divisions that we're trying to see in this country. Like we can do this. We're doing this in Beltrami County. Donald Trump was down the street here this week, this last week, you know, I mean, and we're we're putting up solar. I, I was I was in the restaurants here in Bemidji and I told them what I do and they were like, that is so cool, you know? And so, I mean, we we can come together around this. We can put it t t together our, our differences and w we can build a better future because I think everybody wants to do that. I no, mean- I love that. You, know? you are lighting a fire right now. Just um, amazing to see how just in the midst of all the obstacles, you are like so optimistic and positive and just looking at all of the people that you're working with up on the roof, just like really fueling your drive. So thank you so much for the work that you are doing. Um, it's just an honor to know you and work with you. And I am feeling lighter and excited. So thank you, <laughs> thank you everyone. Thank you, Justin climate generation. <laughs> Thanks, Bob.
Uh, I'm so glad that we got that to work and got Bob on. Um, we're just nearing the end of our time together and um, hopefully you are feeling like you got something out of our time. Um, we do wanna just uh, share with you a, a, another live action opportunity, which is really important. We are collecting letters right now and we had mentioned that earlier that we want to hear from all of you. Um, if you live in Minnesota, we'd love to get a letter and we have made it as easy as possible with a fill in the blank um, letter template, which you can personalize with your own climate story. And maybe you want to inc incorporate into it the vision that you have for the future. So um, this may actually take you a little bit of time. So we invite you to go visit um, that link and you will find the template there. You can personalize it and submit it and it will come to Climate Generation. And again, we are um, pairing all of those constituent letters with copies of the eyewitness book to deliver to every Minnesota legislator in 2021. And if you don't live in Minnesota, you can feel free to use this letter template to contact your own legislator and engage with them to demand bold action on climate change. Um, and because Eyewitness is really a project about literary activism, we feel like this uh, opportunity to write a letter and to truly let your own voice be heard is a really important part. So we hope that you will save that link, come back to it, personalize your letter and be part of the work that we can do together. In closing, we wanna say a generous thank you to Taji, Eric and Bob for taking time out of their day to join us and to get us feeling inspired, hopefully feeling renewed and like we can keep going. Um, and so I just wanna thank all of them for the amazing work that they're doing. And um, I also wanna thank all of you who were able to join us today in this workshop and for all of the actions that you took. So we did wanna just do a quick recap of all of the things that we went over today. So um, first you had an opportunity to sign a petition to make it clear that climate justice is racial justice and that we should demand that from our legislators. We also had an opportunity to reflect on our own vision of what a better world would look like. And then you have a letter to complete about the leadership that you demand for the actions our communities need. And of course, we don't want you to stop there. Um, November 3rd, we will all have uh, an opportunity to vote if you are eligible. So please make sure that you're registered and ready for that. And then, uh, in closing, we will have a few slides. Um, one of them will have information about how you can learn more about our guests today, how you can follow them and learn more about their work. And then we also have information on how you can order a copy of the Eyewitness book and stay connected to Climate Generation. And with that, I wanna thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.